You're listening to The Gathering, a podcast for artists and creatives from Arts Lancashire. I'm Alex O'Toole and this is episode five of series two. This season is all about remaking and remodelling the role and work of artists and creatives in a Covid world and the practicalities of creating and delivering at a distance. We talk about working within the new restrictions, where the opportunities are, how to rip up the rule book, and why it's more important than ever to ensure that our artistic practice, our places and spaces, and opportunities to make and participate are consistently inclusive and representative. For this episode, we're joined by Jonathan Mays from Claw Leadership's Governance Alliance, and Matt Wilde, Director of Blaze Arts, to explore how the pandemic and the many issues around social injustice has impacted on the work of trustees and the relationships between boards and the operational teams of cultural organisations. It's never been more important to have good governance, but now that the pressure is on for boards to provide real-time responses to the challenges brought by COVID, how does that affect decision-making? As we dive into the nuanced issues facing trustees in this moment, We consider how board structure impacts on attitude to risk and influences strategy and programming. We look at how a more considered approach to board recruitment can ensure more diversity and a better representation of the community it serves. We talk about how the alignment of individual motivations with organisational objectives creates space for all parties to grow and we tackle the age-old question of whether board members should be paid and what it might mean if they were. Hello, good morning. I'm Jonathan Mays. I am the Head of Strategic Partnerships and Impact at Claw Leadership. I'm Matt, Matt Wild. I'm the Founding Director of Blaze Arts, which is a youth-led charity based in Lancashire. I'm also a musician, producer, uh, music producer, um, amongst other things. So the nature of my work sort of gives me the privilege, really, um, of speaking with lots of different leadership teams in the cultural sector. And in my conversations, a subject that comes up often is governance and the relationship between boards of trustees and operational teams. But I would say that since COVID, that conversation has consistently pushed its way to the front of the line. But it's always in hushed tones and it's always behind closed doors. And whilst that's completely understandable, there are so many common issues Um, not just here in Lancashire, but for organisations across the country, from, you know, how individual organisations are dealing with the challenges presented by the pandemic, but also in terms of how they're responding to the many sort of social injustice issues that are simultaneously being highlighted. So it seemed to me that it might be worthwhile looking at this subject with sort of a more global view and exploring how some of these issues are affecting general board level operations and relations and then perhaps you know through our conversation today we can put forward some examples and approaches for managing some of those tensions around board operations uh, and relationships and then perhaps looking at some of the ways of thinking about the more nuanced aspects of governing a cultural organization so that's kind of the basis of uh, the podcast and what our conversation might be today we've only got an hour yeah, I've only got an hour. I know it's a big, it's a huge topic, but you know, let's give it a go. I mean, every single one of my my questions for you really are taken out by themselves, but you know, let's give it a go. So, Jonathan, can you tell us a little bit more about your work with boards and how COVID has impacted on the work of boards in the cultural sector? Sure. Um, so, Claw Leadership ourselves have always done an element of work with boards and particularly with leaders to help them work with boards. But over the last few years, um, well, since 2017, we helped establish the Cultural Governance Alliance. So most of what we're doing with boards is funneled through that alliance. That's a broad um, church of organisations who have come together exactly to do that, to help organisations talk about their boards, work on their boards, create good governance. So a lot of the activity there is stuff which is trying to get board members to talk to each other, not just in their own organisation, but more widely. Good example at the moment is our Governance Now conference. So that's on at the moment every November. And this year, obviously, we're doing it a bit differently. It's being delivered online across the month. In fact, 
when this podcast goes out, there'll still be one session left. So I'm going to put my plug in now for the 26th of November, partly because Matt, Matt is there. He's one of our provocation speakers and he's going to upset the apple cart a little bit, I hope. Um, but actually, that, and I say that jokingly, but actually that's part of the point is that you create these spaces in order to have open conversations, honest conversations, which sometimes it's difficult to do when you're on a board of trustees, when you're both dealing with sensitive information, but also information where you might feel nervous about what it is you can explore or talk about. So we do things like that, an annual conference. We have a number of programs um, about diversifying boards, about um, how chairs and CEOs operate together and spaces where board members can talk to each other safely. I think that's the key thing about it. You asked a bit about how it's changed in the pandemic as well, I think, yeah. And in that respect, I think what we're seeing is pressure on decision-making timelines. That's, that's the, the fundamental issue around the pandemic. It's not, clearly the issues are big ones, but boards have always dealt with big issues, existential things around funding, around um, purpose, mission. But what has happened over the last six months has very much been a, a shift for organizations who perhaps their trustees would normally sit around a board meeting and talk about strategy, which might be on the three year, the five year, even the 10 year scale. Suddenly they're thrust into meetings, probably emergency meetings, where the organization has had most or some of their revenue stripped away. And so the trustees find themselves in this unusual position of normally steering an oil tanker, or at least the timing of steering an oil tanker, and then suddenly having to, to really pivot and shift. And as executives and organizations, that's it's not easy, but it's easier to envisage because you're dealing with the day-to-day -day anyway. As trustees, that's harder because typically or not, and typically you're given lots of time to make decisions and therefore you can feel like you can explore the implications. And right now trustees are often being asked to make decisions without really understanding what the implications are. I think that's the big change. Yeah, I mean, that has huge practical implications as well, doesn't it? Just in terms of how often people are meeting, how they're having those conversations, where they're having those conversations. And I guess it puts a lot of pressure on those operational teams to get that information to them in a yeah. way that's understandable and accessible. That's really true. That is really true. And, and it, it's, you know, I'm a trustee myself, so I've sort of sat on the, that side of the table saying, actually, I need this information to make a decision. Understanding yeah. full well that the chief executive and their team are probably got a million jobs to do yeah not least that one yeah so that's another layer of, of tension really mm. Mm. just to sort of bring it back you know to sort of more a, a really global view what should a good board look like and feel like if you're a board member because yeah. i think well this is quite an intuitive thing and you you know when something feels right or or not and also you know what should it look like and feel like if you're part of the operational delivery team because i think the two things are different yeah i mean i'm going to ask matt to pitch pitch him where he feels necessary here but i think the fundamental thing to say here is there is no one size fits all answer to that question it very much varies and depends on what organization you are a trustee or a board member for i think there are a few fundamentals though i think um everyone around the board table should have a voice I think that's a really critical element of that. There's, I think we've all probably come across organizations where that doesn't necessarily happen. Yeah. So I think for me, the top priority would always be every single person having a voice and finding a way for them to have a voice. That doesn't necessarily always mean shouting loudest, does it? And interestingly, actually in COVID times, there are more opportunities to do that. Yes. I've read quite a lot else out there that said, you know, actually you can really actively mute somebody. If you want to, a bit like Donald Trump in that, in that wonderful debate where actually I bet the moderator wishes they just pressed the mute button. Sometimes delicately yeah. done, <laughs> yeah. a well-placed mute is, is a very useful thing. I think I think alongside that, everybody has a voice. There's, there's something around the culture, the culture of always being able to ask the stupid question. And again, that's something that I've seen done well at boards and I've seen done badly at boards, but sometimes the obvious question, the stupid one is the one that actually leads to the best discussion, the best decision-making. And sometimes people can be really scared of that, particularly newer trustees. And we'll talk about new and diverse trustees later and young trustees, obviously with Matt. There's an element there to which how the dynamic and culture of that board operates can lead people to think, well, that person over there, the, the, the lawyer in the corner or the person who's from the investment bank, they sound like they know what they're talking about. So why would I ask the question about why that figure doesn't add up in my head? 
but actually it probably doesn't add up. You've probably been asked to be a trustee because you have an ability to recognize and spot those things. Mm. Um, and some of it's common sense and that, that should always be there. The board should always reflect the community which it serves. That's a complicated thing to actually unpick, but, but it doesn't happen often and it should. It should have the skills required to interrogate those decisions, analyze, challenge, mm -hmm. and to support the executive team. And on that side, I think, you know, why a board? What's the board for? I think there is a purpose in the board adding an element of pressure to the executive, good pressure, where if it wasn't there, and I, you know, I think you look at organizations that don't have boards of trustees. Um, I was talking to Alan Lane at Slung Low about this the other day. There are you know, lots of us know about them. They're doing great work. They don't have a board. And that gives them an ability to, to turn around quickly, but it also takes away both a safety net and and a, a voice which helps you to, to reflect and pushes you to reflect. Now, they, they achieve that in other ways. They have a an advisory group and so on. But a board's role can and should be to push just to that level that says, have you as an executive thought hard enough? Have you made assumptions? So that's an important part. Yeah, um, definitely. Because it can be quite lonely. Uh, when you're making these tough decisions as a mm. as the leadership team or the person at the top. Yeah. Uh, it's good to have that founding board. And I think the, the other thing, I was trying to think about this a little bit more from a kind of moral standpoint and what should boards be and do? And I feel like they ought to have a purpose. I think a lot of where a board may struggle is when they don't really necessarily understand what they're there for. It is a bit of that pressure thing, but it's also about sort of understanding what the organisation is, who the organisation is they're representing and what that mission is and how they therefore as trustees link to that. Mm. If, if I'm brought into a board as a, somebody that has finance expertise or, or legal or specific expertise to that, that sector, what is it about my sitting there that helps that organization's purpose? I think that's a really important question for both for trustees to ask themselves, but for boards in general. Yeah. And that sort of flips it around then to, to answer your question about what the executive needs from a board. It is that. The executive need the board not just to be the guy with the whip that says no. They need them to be the ones that say, keep on, keep on bringing the executive back to here's your mission, here's your purpose. Yeah. Is that decision making actually driving you towards that purpose? And if it's not, then we're here to help and support you and to try and do so. And if it is, great, we'll champion it and we will celebrate it and shout about it. But I think fundamentally that's that's kind of the the, the moral driver for a board or ought to be yeah I, I totally agree with that it needs that rigor doesn't it to make sure mm. that we as operational teams are delivering against that purpose because it's quite easy sometimes to have what people describe as mission drift because there are so mm. many bright lights particularly in the cultural sector that things look interesting and you meet someone really interesting and they've got this really cool idea and and it's quite hard to almost maintain that curation of your own program in, in many ways I know I'm sitting here thinking well how, how does the boards that I'm on apply all those things and I'll definitely be thinking about that going forward so Matt the membership and the work of Blaze's board of trustees is well it's pioneering isn't it in terms of putting young people at the heart of the makeup of its board can you talk a little bit about how your board is structured and the motivations behind it because it's really quite interesting how you've done what you've done yeah, sure. So I'd just like to take a second just to reflect on how we became a charity, if that's OK. Yeah, of so Blaze started as a project in 2012. The reason I hesitated is probably because it happened slightly earlier than that. But let's say 2012 as part of uh, London 2012 Olympic Games or the Cultural Olympiad. And the idea for Blaze, the project, it actually had a slightly different title back then, but Blaze the Project was that young people from across the Northwest would get together regularly to learn and become producers of a festival that celebrated art, culture and sport. And it would be part of the Northwest closing event for London 2012 Olympic Games. And I think that really set the precedent for the work we're doing today, which is the reason I thought I'd just take this opportunity to reflect back on it. Uh, so Blaze, as a project, was run by young people from conception to completion. A festival that had quite a decent budget around the time of the Olympics was managed by young people from the Northwest. 
and put my hand up. I was actually involved in that process as a producer, as a participant. I'd never experienced anything like it before in my life. I was interested in producing events. And when I heard about the opportunity, I couldn't believe it firstly was real. And secondly, I just had to get involved. So as we know, big cultural and or sporting events do come to an end. And as the Olympics came to an end, we were really thinking about what we could do next. Who's we? Myself and 20 other uh, young producers who were involved in a process that saw us collaborating every week for about a year. So once a week for about a year, getting together to collaborate in producing this festival. So we worked with local councils and other stakeholders to define what our next steps could be. And to cut a long story short, we transitioned from being what I like to remember, and this is just my uh, interpretation, this might not be how others remember it, but from a large cultural project with a sizable budget to becoming a really small DIY young person led project overnight, it felt, uh, although in reality it probably wasn't. So fast forward to 2017, we began to become slightly more sustainable as a project, collaborating with partners like Curious Minds, who are based in Preston, but work across the Northwest, Lancashire County Council, Preston City Council, as well as like loads of other arts and cultural partners. Uh, we decided now is the time to constitute in our own right. And the vehicle we chose was to become a charity. So we did that. And during that process, because Blaze has been led by young people from its inception, it gave us the opportunity to really interrogate what we mean by that. What do we really mean when we say young people lead Blaze? And the way we define it, and this might forever change, but at least in that moment was that young people are involved and can involve themselves, they're two distinctly different things, can involve themselves at all levels of the decision-making process of Blaze. And for us, that meant our board of trustees. So when we constituted Blaze, we built that into our constitution. And the way we defined it and continue to do so is that a minimum of 51% of our trustees will be aged 30 and under. Thus, I guess, constitutionally, um, making Blaze young person led at the highest level, so to speak. What's the youngest age that you can become a trustee? So I think think the, 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 tr the true answer is age 16, although I think lots of other people think it's 18. But when we were researching it, we found that it was 16. And this is just my memory. So Jonathan or, or Alex, I'm sure you might know otherwise. But between the ages of 16 and 18, uh, as a trustee, you can't legally vote for, for items and you can't vote for, for decisions. So it's not quite the role of a trustee at that point. So I'd, so I'd encourage anyone who's 18 and over to consider joining a board. To be honest, I don't know the answer to that question. I think it's a good question as to, to what the youngest age is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so they could potentially be on the board as like an observer. And yeah. then after 18, they can actually participate fully. That's exactly, yeah, um, what I was trying to say. You put it brilliantly. <laughs> but yeah, 16 to, 16 to 18, observe, 18 plus, become a trustee, and yeah, have the same rights as everybody else who's in the room. And we need a different word other than observer, right? Because observer yeah. is not necessarily the right word there. No, oh, because they will, exactly. import, they just can't vote necessarily. Mm, yeah, that's yeah. so interesting. And I can't think of any other organisation that I've come across that has yeah. that in their constitution, which is phenomenal. So what has the impact of those younger trustees been on the organisation and also, you know, on, on you and, and your colleagues as the delivery team? I think the impact has been really profound in many ways. And the reason being is that those who are on the board of Blaze, the younger trustees who are age 30 or under, really have never known a world without on-demand access to all information at our fingertips. So growing up in a world with Google, growing up in a world with, you know, the Internet basically has meant, at least uh, in my observations and conversations, that young people see the world somewhat differently. You know, young people can and often lead by example online by starting things for themselves from businesses to uh, clothing lines to organizations to uh, content creation, YouTube channels. 
and can monetize their ideas and their passions in a way that I think maybe wasn't happening um, in the same kind of way, I don't know, 30 years ago. That's totally true. It just, yeah. it couldn't happen 30 years ago. So the world is very yeah. different. So, and I think growing up in a world like that, that's natural to them has meant that they show up at our board meetings uh, in a way that is socially responsible. Jonathan, you talked about the ethics, you know, behind mm. trustees and, and, and moral obligation. And I think the younger trustees have really held me accountable to mm. our direction, our mission as an organization. And they've provided consistent and regular positive challenge around how we do what we do and why we're doing it and who we do it with. So for example, in light of George Floyd's death and the light that was shone on Black Lives Matter and continues to be, the board meeting following that, uh, the younger trustees really challenged and were really positive around supporting our team and myself to develop positive action as an organization. So that was their opportunity and continues to be a collaborative opportunity to influence what it is that we do going forward. So we have regular positive action uh, working groups. It's currently our only sub working group. I know boards tend to develop lots of little working group, but that's one that is so important. And I think we'll set the precedent for Blazer's work to come. We only constituted two years ago as an organization. So we, despite the fact that we had the story of the Olympics, I still consider Blaze Arts CIO to be in its infancy. And I think that at this pivotal moment, those conversations, I think, are really what gets me out of bed in the morning and are the things that we're challenging and we are having conversations around. And I think it's brilliant because it provides a space for all of us to be open and honest and share. And even if we have fears around, I don't know, like the terminology that the sector uses to describe people who are ethnically diverse, that's a space where we can, where we can talk about those things. And I hope we'll set the precedent for Blaze. Matt, I, I was meaning to ask you this the other day when we were talking before, but I'm interested to know about how the, what your perception is of your board's ability to compromise. Because you're right, the young people coming into these situations, not just at boards, but just more generally, are really impassioned by current social injustice issues, right? And that's brilliant. Clearly, you, know, you see the marches on the street, you see them mostly being younger people doing that. And it's great to have that in the board and in the boardroom. But of course, one of the elements of what a board of trustees has to do at some point is compromise. They have to compromise with knowing that, that you, you've got an ambition and a, and a mission over here, but a, a budget which can only achieve so much. And I'm, I'm really intrigued as to what your perception of that, particularly with your younger your trustees who are under 30 is, whether they struggle in that area, or whether there's a, a divide in terms of on your board, the, the, the appetite for compromise. I think there's a lot of work that we need to do and where we are today is probably going to be we're going to be somewhere very different in the future but today and in our infancy and having experimented and ran board meetings for two years I would say that the decisions and conversations we have are in the context of the, the reality of where we mm. are so the budget that Blaze has the number, the bottom line on our management accounts, our program and project budgets. So we work within and make decisions and have conversations within that territory. So for example, a conversation we're having readily at the moment is what percentage of all of our project budgets can we ring fence or dedicate to supporting black businesses? That's just one conversation of many, but that's within the context of something that we can have influence over. So I think compromise happens, but because Blaze is still in its infancy, we're, we're still forming. We have a strong vision and mission, and not to say that we, we, we drift from it, or although we probably have at, at times. That's the nature of a, of a good business, isn't it? It's responding to the environment. And, and as we were saying the other day, Matt, you know, organisations, they're like a living thing, and, and they're changing and growing and all the time. But I think that's absolutely phenomenal in terms of, you know, you've got governance which is, you know, some of these issues that we're talking about now, the Black Lives Matter issues around uh, accessibility and disabled led approaches and, th and things like that. They are all part of good governance. Yet the way that you are tackling it is board is actually influencing the programme. 
which if if as Jonathan said before, it should be representative of the communities that they they that is exactly what should be happening. And so you're demonstrating that in a really beautiful way, I think. Thank you. So mm. our story is our own. It's unique to us and we can compromise and we're quite a uh, shape shift a little bit and agile. we can be quite fle- flexible. We're nimble. Yeah, agile. Um, but I've experienced as a trustee on two other boards and compromise on, on other boards that I've had involvement in uh, would be a different matter. But again, mm. that's unique to that circumstance and that organisation. You know, if an organisation has been here for 30 years and is dealing with budgets, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 times that of Blaze, or maybe even more, that has a certain institutionalised approach to its working. I think that's harder to dismantle through compromise than Blaze in its infancy. It's a very good point, actually. I, in, in many ways, I think the onus of a board where you've got a smaller budget to deal with and a newer organisation is, is much bigger than that of an established organization. You know, let's go to the whole other end of the music biz and go to the Royal Opera House where they've got systems and channels and, and the way it operates. I've never sat on their board, but I'm sure it feels like there's very limited opportunity for really radical shift and board influence on, on you know, as, as Alex, you just described on, on programming and so on. And I think it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. And I, I would laud Blaze and Matt, what you're doing there is, is just a sort of fabulous example of a, an organization fully understanding what it means to have a board, to have trustees, to have governance that represents where they come from, what they are, what their mission is. And it's it's great. We should be putting this on a, on a, on a pedestal, but just shouting about it as much as we can. Definitely. I mean, these are, you know, these are huge issues that you are exploring through your board and through through your programme. And obviously the role and the responsibilities of board members are also quite, well, they're quite onerous, aren't they? There's a lot of liability there. So how do young people on your board understand it and sort of meet those responsibilities? And, and what kind of additional support have you had to put in place to help them understand and get to grips with those things? Because you know, quite often some of the, the financial and legal implications of being on a board they're quite weight and young people might not have had experience of those kind of responsibilities before. Mm. Yeah, great question. So I'll answer this in two parts. Firstly, what we've done to date and how we've approached it to date and then how that has informed how we might approach it going forward. So firstly, I would say our approach is for, I guess, all trustees, you know, regardless of age, I think it's always good to refresh and, and know our responsibilities and liabilities around the table. So when we recruited or launched a call out for trustees, we created a summary or easy to read read version of what those liabilities are so that from the get go, uh, anyone who might express interest, hopefully will have an understanding, at least uh, in broad terms, about what the liability of becoming a trustee is. So that was initially. And then when we first got together, we had some board development sessions that continue to explore these themes but I guess I'm quite interested in how we then apply that in action so how we might work together to uh, ensure the legal responsibility is governed in the best possible way or ensuring that everyone around the table has a basic understanding of reading our management accounts amongst other things so how we apply those liabilities and make them our own and put them into practice so Another approach is that I have regular one-to-one catch-ups with trustees, which is a really important part of of this for me, at least, um, and I hope for others too. And I know that, you know, you might think, wow, well, you know, you have nine or 10 trustees that can become quite time consuming. And I would say it's, yes, perhaps, but it's deeply inspiring and also ensures that outside of being in a board meeting together, we can have opportunities to be open and honest. So it's in those moments that even myself, I can talk openly about where I feel my strengths lie and my assets lie and where I would love to see additional support from the board's perspective. And then that also sets the precedent for good communication, really. And I I think one-to-one or small group conversations is, is and has been powerful in ensuring that we're all on the same page whether that's about our legal responsibility or uh, or otherwise. So that has informed how we do things today. But I think going forward, I would like to build on the work that we've done and develop a, hopefully like a, 
accessible framework so that anyone who joins our board or any other board, hopefully we could possibly share this wider, can have a good grasp of what it means to be a trustee. And I would love to demystify, you know, what that means and make it accessible and hopefully fun or creative in some way to expand the reach of all of our organizations, but particularly Blazers. That's so on the money. And Matt and I have been talking about this. I mean, the- you 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 sort of talking about things which border on the on the idea of training, right? And actually, yeah. I'm not sure if it is assumed, but I think a lot of people maybe assume that you join a board and therefore you're already trained in what you're doing and therefore bring it. But actually, there's such a strong need to have trustees who are well trained in being trustees because they have the, it has its own um, implications. I, I might talk a bit more later. I think about risk and how one approaches risk, but particularly in that sort of area, being trained. That's really interesting. I think, you know, what you were saying, Matt, about those individual conversations, I think that is quite rare and but so needed and explains a lot about how how your success as a, a, you know, a a board that's developing and an organisation that's developing. And I think as well, this sense of action and consequence, you know, some of the issues that your board have decided to sort of pursue and, and explore I wonder whether if they'd had all this institutionalized thinking around them, whether they would have gone down that route because they're, they're so aware of the consequences of actions. And it might have prevented them from, from exploring those things. But equally, sometimes not knowing, not knowing everything or not thinking about down the line is, is a good thing, too. I don't know what I'm trying to say there, really, but I just think what young people can bring is that sense of, Let's try, let's see, let's yeah. have that conversation in a really open way rather than closing it down from the get-go. And there's a key element to the way Matt described that because most of the good work of boards happened outside of the board meeting. So that when he talks about having conversations with the trustees, that's really critical, not just for the chief executive or the CEO, but also for the chair. Mm-hmm. And actually you get most of the really useful movement and action taken away from the board meeting. And the board meeting itself, in reality, ought to just be a kind of, a rubber stamping or perhaps a bit more than that but just a a meeting where kind of everybody knows where it's heading already and you use it to to fulfill the obligation but it's the other conversations that really move things yeah I completely get that and it makes so much sense so I'm going to sort of ask a bit of a divisive question now and I know I've individually had this conversation with, with both of you but given the level of responsibilities that trustees have and particularly in the current climate when there's there's so much uncertainty and there's an increasing need for cultural organisations to become more sustainable and, and this word viable is used a lot. Do you think boards and particularly boards with young people who are in probably the most vulnerable precarious position in terms of job, do you think that boards should be voluntary? Again, it's circumstantial and it depends on the organisation, but I and this needs more work and thinking from Blazer's perspective. That's just like a note to self. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I think it would be really interesting to see. This is from Blazer's perspective. So wearing that hat, firstly, I think it would be really interesting to explore a conversation about what it could look like and what the impact might be if we develop or ensure that a certain percentage or a certain number of the roles of our on our board are recompensed and paid positions i'd be really interested in what the impact could be both in terms of those who join the board but then those who are in paid positions what their roles could be beyond you know board meetings and i would love to see a transition or a move towards and i think it could already be happening uh, although it's just anecdote you know anecdotally in conversations i've had with other others um, i would love to see a transition to some paid or at least properly recompensed roles on various boards as a trustee now having said that that thinking for me is in its infancy i don't know of any good examples of that happening and i'm sure it does happen a conversation that has also come up in our meetings is can the director or ceo also have a position on the board i think that can happen and happens in structures outside of charities so that's also a very interesting conversation too but yeah i would love to see a transition towards paid opportunities and what the impact actually would that would have yeah yeah would be it's quite interesting because you you think of a board is there provide checks and balances 
and outside of the commercial sector that's really needed in 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 a the community or, or charity sectors. However, if someone was paid, why does that affect the checks and balances that they're, they're there to give? And surely if someone wasn't paid, those checks and balances weren't done in a, in a certain way. Does that make them less liable? It, it's, mm. it's so difficult. It's, <laughs> it's really difficult. I think um, there's, there's, a, there's a statutory answer to this question, which is at the moment, the Charities Commission doesn't allow for remuneration of board members. So if you're on a charity board, it's not actually currently allowed. Um, so if we are going to develop that conversation, there's actually quite an interestingly knotty conversation to be had with the Charities Commission, with, with other bodies, you know, NCVO, Akivo, others who are involved in that area. I think the conversation really needs to be had. And I see both sides of the coin here. I suppose you want the argument against remuneration is all about dispassionate decision making. There's no, there's no investment there. And I've seen this, I've sat on or been, my, my prior to law leadership, I worked in orchestras and I've so experienced quite a lot where either the musicians themselves are trustees or where there's musician representatives on boards um, who are observers effectively. And it's interesting seeing how influenced the decision making can become when, when a trustee has a stake in the game. So I, I think there is a, a very important discussion and argument to go with that. However, the flip, and I think the flip side of this is stronger and more important because it, it boils back to what I said about boards being honestly representative. If you want a diverse board, if you want members of your community who you serve to come and sit on that board, I think you have to be open to the idea that some of them will only be able to do that if you recompense them. Mm. You know, freelancers, classic case in point, a lot of organisations work with freelancers. A lot of organisations would benefit from having freelancers on their board. Most freelancers, not all, most would struggle to, with the time commitment, put in a purely practical level, because it would be an either or between doing some other paid work or doing some unpaid work. I don't know how other ways that you could get around that other than saying to them there will be some recompense here. So it's a really important discussion. We're going to start having it, actually. The point, one of the points of inviting Matt to our last session of governance now at the end of this month is, is to have that conversation in an open space so that we can really start going for it. And we, the other, one of the other provocations is from a, a youth board member at the Roundhouse where they're taking a slightly different approach. You know, it's sort of representation on a sort of subsidiary board, but then with full representation to the main Roundhouse board. And of course, that's quite different from what Blaze are doing. And I really want to have that discussion openly and get lots of opinions on this because because until we start having the open discussion it's not going to change yeah i mean it's so interesting because you mentioned the word dispassionate before and mm. i understand that when it comes to checks and balances but then on the flip side you know part of a board's role is to support the organization developing and, and that requires some kind of openness to risk and so if you're always taking that dispassionate approach how does that affect your approach to risk and I guess a big question is how can boards develop a more open attitude to risk taking that is the kind of risk taking needed to develop innovation and to push an organisation forward, particularly now in this situation, as I said before, when we are all being expected to change everything about how we do things because we have mm. to and we need to think differently about the way that we do things. Yeah, it's so true. Um, look, risk risk is at, at the core of what trustees are there to, to do and to think about. It really is topical given COVID-19 particularly, but also Black Lives Matter and also um, We Shall Not Be Moved movements and all of these, these really important social issues. We had a, a, a keynote from Nina Simon, who is a, a museum's um, sector leader in America from last week, and she talked I thought really cogently and intelligently about board members being space makers, that rather than just thinking of themselves as um, people who decide on risk, it's actually the board seeing themselves as, as a bit able to create the environment in which the executive can take risk and knowingly so. Mm. Um, and there's a lot to sort of explore with that, but I think um, fundamentally what it means is it means having a full appreciation and understanding of what risk means. And that word in some ways is really unhelpful. Because most people think of the word risk and think of it negatively. Yes. And of course, actually, it can be a positive thing. And, and we all experience this. If a, if a toddler doesn't take risk in trying to walk, 
they never walk. We all do it. And nobody would suggest that it's it's the wrong risk to take to put that foot forward and maybe fall. And and it seems a silly analogy, but actually maybe it's exactly the right one. Organizations need to have that same understanding and appreciation for what risk really means. It's gonna sound really dull and mechanical, but I think I think risk registers should be documents that actually are quite vibrant. Most people see a risk register and think, oh, bloody hell, that's just boring. It's just there for the sake of being there. In actual fact, it's a map. It's a map that says, here's the contours of the land. Here's, here's, you know, you've got a destination you want to get to. Well, here are all of the hills and valleys that you have to go over in order to get there. If you have a really properly thought through, well thought through, considered risk register, as trustees, you can understand what that journey looks like. Mm. You understand how to get to that destination and what pitfalls lie on the way, what bog you have to cross. And I think doing that means that as trustees, you can take an objective viewpoint of something that sometimes in meetings can become quite subjective. I think that's the key thing for me here. I said dispassionate earlier, but maybe really what I meant was objectivity versus subjectivity yes yeah because if you if you take on board what risk is actually you can realize that most of your decision making is is done in an objective sense and you are simply saying okay i understand that if we take on that bit of programming if we change our programming in that way we may not be able to meet that funder's requirements but i understand that the risk is proportional to the fact that in fact that programming is needed because the world has changed to make, to make it topical to COVID-19 and that actually our community needs it um, and I think that's that for me is, is is actually the really fun oddly bit the fun bit of where risk is it, yeah. it's, it's a bit a bit like map reading yeah I mean I, I do actually wonder how many boards well obviously we're in Lancashire so how many boards in Lancashire have a risk register for connected to their strategy if I really they don't they're mad that's not something I've really come across but mm-hmm. there, there could be boards out there that, that do have that. I mean, there's um, lots of guidance out there on risk registers and risk approaches as well. It, it's, you know, it, in a way it's complicated, but it's not hard. Hmm. Anyway. But, I mean, that's definitely something, you know, I personally would like to explore that a bit more. So, well, I guess as part of that, as part of that conversation, we know that boards have to expand the diversity of their makeup of their Mm. trustees and to be more representative of their community and the groups that they serve. And I guess this ties into their attitude to risk, but there are so many boards out there that are recruiting from the same pool of trustees all the time or the same location. So you've got, quite often you've got people who are more than one board in the same place within the same sector. And it's, Mm. you know, it's the same experience base that a number of organisations are drawing from. And that's a problem and that does affect um, people's attitude to risk or an organisation's attitude to risk. So how would you say that boards widen and deepen their pool of trustees, not just in terms of of young people, but in terms of people who are disabled, for example, people who can't afford to not be there if if they weren't paid, but also in terms of recruiting a board with the really really relevant skills and experience yeah. that are needed to help that organization move forward because that's another that's another issue yeah. people on boards that aren't actually really contributing um look we, we could fill an entire hour and a half podcast by itself to answer this question yeah. in a way i'd turn the question around because a lot of organizations probably have tried to do this and found it difficult mm-hmm. and i think One of the things we've been exploring recently at Claw Leadership, partly because of some of the people we're working with, some of the organizations, is around how actually you need to change the culture of the board itself before it's ready to have the diverse representation that it needs. And that's both about the people, but actually it's also about the way it works. I was at the Arts Council for a while, so I sort of sat and observed quite a lot of boards. And I quite often saw a board make what might be considered a bit tokenistic appointment, particularly around um, people from ethnic minorities. You know, lots of, particularly in the music sector, I think it's true elsewhere as well, lots of boards with quite white trustees predominantly and recognising that that's not appropriate. And great, they've they've recognised the problem, but they're not necessarily thought too hard about how the solution works. And so you end up with potentially people arriving in good faith into a governance environment onto a board 
and feeling isolated very quickly and yeah. feeling not necessarily able or feeling like frankly the person that's been brought in to be a little bit prickly and annoying rather than a proper fully embodied member of that of that group so i think there's a, an awful lot of work for organizations to do to think about how the culture of their board works in the first instance it's not good enough just to say we want these types of people because actually you have to turn around and say how are we going to make it that these types of people when they're part of our board have a full voice around this table some of that is about changing some of you know frankly if you've got a, a board of 10 people and they're all the same mm. as you were describing alex clearly in bringing in perhaps two or three new people well and then and then the, some of that change is happening but there's a key difference there qualitative difference between one person who may feel a bit tokenistic and say two or three people mm. who might themselves change the ethos and and have more confidence to do so because they're doing it as part of a cohort Matt should talk about this as well because he's done it he's lived and breathed it um but I think one of the other things is thinking about really carefully how you're asking and he said it earlier they mapped out really clearly what the responsibilities of trustees are when they were recruiting for blaze and there are lots of really bad adverts out there for trustees that don't really say anything at all you know what is it you're asking of trustees how many meetings are there a year what's your ethos as an organization what do you expect of trustees across a three-year term you know what input are they going to be asked to give how are you going to be open to that input? all of those questions that need to be full frontal when you go out there publicly and say we're looking for new people mm. do you want to chip into that matt at all yeah this is a a topic of conversation that i've been involved in even before uh, the discussion around boards you know blaze does this uh, and has done this um intrinsically in, in our work you know through participation as well and i think similar principles i i think around ensuring participation our programs and projects reach uh those who are ethnically diverse or have other protected characteristics i think some of the same principles for that also translate to boards so I, just a, a couple of points so i think the f first thing when people ask me you know how, how do you do you know how do you do that at blaze i think it's it has to be a real commitment from people so it sounds really simple um but i've seen people's commitment on this topic be very different and i think firstly we need to be like cognizant of like our unconscious biases so firstly i think that we all have unconscious bias you know and no matter who we are we we, we hold unconscious bias within ourselves i think those who are most committed sometimes can can recognize and maybe even articulate where and what their own unconscious bias is and don't use it as a disclaimer to like absolve people of their responsibility i see that happen a lot uh, and observe that so it sounds really simple mm. but commitment <laughs> so in order to be authentically inclusive i think real time and energy is needed and should be set you know like i was talking about one those one-to-one -one conversations that's just something that i i set and that's like when you put and build space in your diaries for those moments i think that that really begins to show and demonstrate commitment at least to ourselves so i think that sounds really simple but like to be really committed to be conscious of our biases because we all have them so yeah. what are yours do you use those biases as a disclaimer to absolve you of your responsibility i know when i was younger i definitely might have done that you know um, and it's only through conversations with other people that i've become i guess more culturally intelligent so i think another part is on a board particularly we need to get curious about our cultural differences so what societal frameworks exist worldwide that stop people from stepping into these roles even clicking on a on an advert that invites expressions of interest to become a, a trustee what stops people what frameworks or societal obstacles exist mm. that stop people doing that and i yeah, think and where, where is the advert right where are you actually yeah. putting that advert we well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's such a basic thing isn't it but it's really important um, and just to pick up on what Matt says, because it's entirely right. And if you get that right at board level, then you will get it right at organization level. You cannot but get it right level at organizational level. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, it, it is, it's the beginning of everything in terms of organizations' ability to really, truly become part of their community, to represent, to embody what they want to deliver. Yeah, exactly. And and it's not about creating an echo chamber. It's about creating a space for this debate. And as you mm. said, becoming a space maker. 
on the sort of flip side of all of that, we need this injection of a diverse board for all of our cultural organisations. But equally, we also need some stability. And there's often quite a lot of movement in mm. boards uh, or on boards. You know, someone will come in for 12 months, even sometimes even shorter, because they're serving a bit of time on a board, they can put it on their CV, great. But that is quite disruptive as well. So what is the optimum amount of time and, and how do you sort of minimise negative churn, let's call it, on board, yeah. but stop yeah. and make sure it doesn't become stale at the same time? Yeah. Look, I would question any any scenario in which a, a fully fledged board member is only joining for twelve months. Mm. I don't think that's helpful to anybody, either the either the trustee or to the board. I think there there are cases where you might create a subcommittee where you bring co op somebody in in that kind of environment, particularly around fundraising and others. I think if you go back to your memorandum and articles as an organisation, anybody listening to this podcast, I would ask you to go and check what your your memorandum say. You know, most will say somewhere around three years, possibly four, probably for two terms, and that. You know that's tried and tested and i think for good reason i think that sort of length of time if if people think about joining a board a bit akin to how they take on a new job and most people going into a new job will consider that first six to 12 months as learning right you're, you're, you're going in and you're learning the space so the idea that you can do something for 12 months on a board and be any sort of useful contribution i think is is foolish because you, you need to spend that time getting used to the culture influencing the culture as well but, but learning and then and then you've perhaps got a year or two in that first term if it's three years to really make an impact so to ask yourself the question what am i doing here as a board member how am i supporting this organization mm. helping it change helping it grow um helping it survive in the current context so i think i think there's a lot to be said for that sort of time length of around three years it's not set in stone and it shouldn't be it may be i mean matt this is, i think is quite interesting in, in your context of you know, when you and I talked last, we talked about the idea that if you've got a 51% minimum of your board being under 30, the implication of turnover and churn there, if, if you're recruiting people who are relatively close to that cutoff, and how you think about succession planning there is tricky. And we talked, I think, correct me if, if I'm paraphrasing wrongly, but we effectively talked about you bringing in people when they're relatively young still, them doing a, a stint with you, probably going off somewhere else when they get to 30, and going... 10, 20 years somewhere else, developing, doing their own career, being on trustees elsewhere, and then maybe coming back. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, Matt and I have also had a conversation, like what is the cycle? What is the optimum cycle for a board member? Is three years enough? Should it be more like five? And are, is it like an arc of influence, I guess, and responsibility on that board that as you develop your understanding um, over the, the first couple of years, and then year three, you really helping to properly mm. drive that organization and then you're sort of handing over and succession planning as you're saying mm. there's something i forgot to say in all of this actually and that's about induction and how you in when it, when you have a new board member actually what it is you're doing to help them join that board and that's critical um, yeah onboarding yeah that's a whole other, whole other topic and um, you know i mean this is it's so huge this topic you could be here for hours but and <laughs> we've only got a little bit of time left so one question and one concern that i get all the time from people is you know how do i get more people on my board to take responsibility for stuff it's always the same couple of people doing it and the rest are just there to say yes or no how do you instill a more balanced collective responsibility for the work of the board and you know do you have any sort of tips advice or examples of how this can be done more effectively because honestly that is the biggest thing that i hear from from colleagues it's those one-to-one -one con conversations you know particularly from the chair i would say i think a chair's job is not just to sit there in a meeting and, and direct the the conversation it's, it's actually to, to ensure that you're getting that participation um, and a chair can and should i think make those individual contacts and ask openly what is motivating that trustee to be there why are they on that board and as soon as a chair understands that motivation they'll either be able to say okay can we direct it somewhere so that you can see your motivation playing itself out as action and therefore you know we're all human and therefore we all need those motivations and drivers to, to, to enact work right or if the chair has those conversations and frankly the person has no right being there to be honest with you having the difficult conversations saying, okay maybe this isn't the right thing for you 
because mm. if you've got if you've got dead wood on boards most wood isn't dead most wood is just dormant but if you do want to have honestly dead wood what, you know what are you thinking and i know it's historically been a case that often that's been to do with with money to do with with how finances work but you know we're in we're in 2020 we're a long way beyond those worlds so i think i think a lot of it boils down to the chair but matt will have done this a lot as chief executive yeah. as well yeah i I, w- I would say exactly that i think some of the things that we've already discussed around commitment you know we talked about commitment in the context of diversity and inclusion but the same applies here uh, i would say setting and being conscious about setting time to meet with all trustees i think is a really powerful and for me even very inspirational uh mm. time yeah having the courage to oppose like dominant culture mm. so i think that for me at least that's a really exciting part of being a trustee is having conversations that do oppose what this current dominant culture is whether that's internally within our organizations or externally in society and what role we can play and finally just also having the courage to get it wrong reflect yeah. hold space to to continue conversations but then bounce back with with new learning and mm-hmm. and potentially grow as well so well that leads really nicely my into sort of my last question which is you know given everything we've talked about and all these additional challenges that boards are having to face at the moment uh, in particular would you say that that was one of the biggest incentives for somebody to sit on a board of a cultural organization i'm not sure whether i can answer that for everybody but i can talk from my experience having i'm a trustee at two organizations And my incentives for both of those trustee positions were very different. They might have been compounded by the same things, but I think they were very different. One was a a deep affinity to the organization's mission, having been involved in it as a child, you know, and having had so much learning, experiential learning as a participant and then becoming a trustee. I think that's an organization that I jumped on the possibility of becoming a trustee uh, of because of kind of deep personal reasons uh, associated with the mission of the organization ultimately. And then another one was definitely around opposing dominant culture. They're different organizations of different size. One has a venue, one doesn't. And I think the other organization, I was definitely motivated by the opportunity to oppose dominant culture and also experience new things. So experience, you know, big legal contracts that are, you know, are binding for like up to 20 years huge contracts and commissions and venue management and that's just a world that I had never explored and I, I was very excited to be involved in helping helping even in a small way to to shake that up so they were the, they were my motives but very different reasons one's definitely a, has an affinity to the mission and the vision of the organization um because of personal reasons but and then another is yeah experiencing new things but also shifting the dominant culture yeah so but both both about making an impact though a positive yes. impact yeah mm. what about well reflected yeah um i totally agree with matt on this i think i think before anything else there's this sense of am i driven by what that organization wants to do and and if you're not there's no don't go near it but you you have to have that drive um i think then other than what matt has already said there's something about giving and I think there's something about the human need to give that can be reflected really interestingly through becoming a trustee. Most of what we do in professionals is one way or another motivated about where we want to go. You know, it's, it's focused on yourself, your career, your sort of how you want to develop and, and art forms and so on. And, and actually, there's, there's something exceptionally rewarding about that giving element of being a trustee. Um, and it should, I don't think we should downplay it. And it, of course, it, it sort of, it ties into that conversation we had earlier about about remuneration as well and i'm not saying that giving is is necessarily free giving but but certainly one in which in which you're taking the 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 active choice to step outside of your own personal needs mm. and to, to to give in a different context and i think that is like i say very very rewarding yeah it's very powerful you, just to give mm, just because you can and you have yeah, the time. And, and, and look, it's never been more important for organisations to have great trustees, to have good governance. Never more important. Mm. It's, you know, it's critical right now. 
thank you so much. It's such an interesting topic and I'm so glad that we've had this opportunity to maybe just explore it a little bit. I, I just feel like there's so many more conversations yeah. we could have, we need to have. Um, and I know that there are people out there that would will be really thankful for some of the conversations that we've had today it might help them with the situation that they're dealing with or just shift their thinking a little bit around around some of the issues that they've got thank you so much honestly yeah. for you know bringing us together and yeah. yeah and jonathan as well to be able to share share this space with the two of you has, has been really yeah really insightful you know i yeah. always leave conversations like this with some really good notes and you know some yeah. bits of thinking and um, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for listening to The Gathering. If you like this episode, let us know in the reviews and don't forget to share it with your friends. For show notes, links to all the organisations and initiatives mentioned in this episode and much more, head over to www.artslancashire.org.uk slash The Gathering. You can also follow Arts Lancashire on Twitter at Arts Lancashire to hear when each new episode goes live.